welcome back to the Farmer to Farmer 2019 live stream. Thank you so much for bearing with us as we figure this thing out as we go along. It's been so fun to have you here, almost as fun as it's gonna be to chat with my next three guests who all happen to be agronomists, but I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Holly Thrasher, and I am a senior staff agronomist here at FBN. I'm Darren Lechfeld. I'm the head of agronomy, so I put together a team of agronomists like you see these fine folks here. I'm Leroy Tuohy. I'm much like Holly, a senior staff agronomist. He tries to be like me. <laughs> Doesn't work all the time, but I give it a shot. And so, we all try to be like Doyle. Yes. Incredible. <laughs> so basically, the, a big crux of the conversation we've been having today is that 2019 was a bit of a year, yeah. I think we could say. You guys have 115 years of combined experience. I'm sure all of you saw 2019 coming. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Look yeah. at that crystal ball, and I was like, oh, this is going to get really fun really quick. Well, and it's an example of a year where all the risks associated with being farming, uh, being in farming, just came to fruition. I mean, it was like one thing after another kept hitting farmers. And having the ability for to talk to experienced agronomists was just really important to our members. Um, and especially an agronomy team that we put together that's independent and unbiased. We're not tied to any particular company, or and we give advice that's truly farmers first, so, and what's best for that farmer. So. You know, I think one of the things I hear from farmers a lot is, most of the time farmers, I don't want to say don't need agronomists, because you guys are very important, but what? farmers <laughs> are agronomists. Farmers know about yeah, yeah. their land, they know about their seed, they know about their product, but when a farmer needs an agronomist, they need an agronomist. Mm -hmm. yeah. 2019 was one of those years. Talk to me about, maybe share some stories if you can, how, it, was there any way for farmers to manage through this? There's, there's always a way to manage. No matter what Mother Nature throws at you, the economy, the markets, it, it doesn't matter. You can manage risk, and, and, and the good ones do it. A lot of our members do it very well. Uh, Seeds-wise, just as an example, in the spring when it's really wet, saturated conditions, that's a challenge to plant the seed correctly and timely. Um, some guys had to go out literally in rain and finish planting. And you could kind of imagine as an agronomist, that's an outstanding opportunity because we know we're gonna get calls on those kind of situations to help them figure out what they can do from that point on. So managing risk is, is like anything, whether you're uh, working as a nurse or a doctor or as a farmer or as an agronomist, you, you, you figure it out over time. Um, you know, I, I don't want to date anybody, but the older guys know what they're doing for a reason. They've been doing it a long time. And the young guys really lean on those older guys. And I don't mean older agronomists, I mean older farmers. Much like at our crop circle forums, there's a lot of great communication to manage those types of situations. I want to ask, what when you guys are talking to farmers, you literally have advanced degrees, you've spent your life understanding agronomy, and this is something that farmers kind of just have to intuit. There's some data that they can get, there's some things that they can understand about their operations. When you're talking to farmers, but I mean, farmers also have about 45,000 other jobs day to day. What can farmers pay attention to that's manageable from day to day or from week to week? What, how, how do you help guide farmers through keeping track of agronomy and, and keeping that kind of in the scope of everything else they're doing? Holly, take this one. <laughs> well, they do have a lot going on. And I will say one thing about agronomists. Um, we love talking agronomy, and sometimes it's hard for us not to get down into the weeds of things and maybe Is that an agronomy things. pun? Exactly. Yeah, it kind of is. That's oh very good. Agronomy humor. Didn't even realize she did it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, get, get into the weeds of things and, and really over-explain. Um, and for us to, to take a step back and realize that farmers do have a lot go on their plate at, at all times and really dial it down to the need to know information for them to uh, make the right uh, decision on their farm and uh, help mitigate risk for whatever that situation uh, is. Good example, 2019 started off very wet. Everyone's gonna be late with planting. Prevent plant comes up, insurance deadlines are coming. I could get payments, I might not get payments. We started talking about going to uh, cover crops in season. Cover crops are normally done in the fall, so farmers are obviously have a lot of questions about what I could be doing, yet planting a cover crop in June, you know, and well, then you've got to interact with your insurance agent, 
Uh, you got to be looking at what government payments you'd be eligible still for, to get, what cover crops are available. If I do that, what chemistry can I use on that? It just becomes a quandary in a hurry. So speaking to people with a lot of experience comes in really handy for FBN members. So, Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of new front issues that are on the front lines for farmers that, you know, especially as they're trying to manage through some of the uncertainty on the agronomic side, soil health, cover crops, no-till. How do you, how do, how should farmers be thinking through that stuff? Making those changes or, you know, scaling up those changes? What does that calculation look like? It, it varies from year to year and not even so much year to year, but even month to month sometimes. Like Darren was saying this year earlier in the spring, we all had this great expectation that we were going to have a normal planting season or cycle, whatever normal is in, in your region. But as things change, you figure out quickly how to mitigate those things. Otherwise, you get buried for the year. Um, some guys did get buried. They end up taking prevent plants and, and taking the write-offs, and they just have to do that because they have no other options. But then there's other situations where they end up planting in June and, and really messing up the timeline the rest of the year. So. You know, whether it's figuring out your soil fertility, your herbicide programs, your, your nutrient inputs, all of that changes throughout the year. And the good managers, the really good, the good farmers can adjust on the fly, much, much like we do as, as FBN. We're, we're, we move around a lot as a company. Uh, we stay nimble and, and loose and loosey-goosey, and a lot of farmers had to be that way this year. Most guys don't like being that way. They really want to have a plan and go forward with the plan. But, but a year like this, that plan was out the window 30 days into the planting season. It really I'll say was. each of those inputs, the seed, the chemistry, the fertilizer, none of them acts independently of themselves, right? So if I'm going to plant a conventional corn, untreated corn, what's the chemical program? I should be doing with that. What's the fertility program I should be doing with that? Because it's always, it depends. It's be, you know. Um, yep. the if then. If then. If I do this, yes. then I do that. Mm. Yeah. So we're looking at 2020. It looks like there's going to be another really wet spring. Mm. Ah. Things look like that. Hot take <laughs> of the day. No <laughs> rain in the spring. You heard it. It was him, not it me. It rained so much you in the heard fall, it on the internet, so. and then it froze. There's, you, know, you don't need any rain. As you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right, though. Yeah. Uh, the winter has already started way too soon for, for much of the Corn Belt, especially the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Uh, they got crops still in the field that they haven't got out, so now they're looking at spring to finish harvest when they should be getting ready to plant. They're going to be out there combining their crop. So yeah, you're, you're spot on. Even, even if we don't get any more precipitation going forward, there's parts of the country that are already backed up on their plan for spring. Absolutely, it's gonna be a real challenge. So, sell me on why, as a farmer, I should make a plan then. Like, if, there's, if it's gonna get thrown right out the window, why spend a day in the office when I could spend it doing literally anything else? Why, you, you, why do a plan? You have to have a plan. You, you, you truly do. Well, and Holly, she helped develop a crop plan tool. Yeah. You wanna talk yeah. about the crop plan yeah, tool? Yeah, so the crop plan tool is, a, is an awesome asset that FBN members can sit down with, uh, with their account executives and, and really put together that plan, help you to understand what traits are you planning next year? Um, what crop you're planning? How do you put together the right um, the right herbicide plan for each of those fields? Um, and it's a really comprehensive place for you to not only put together what your inputs are going to be, but then also looking at okay, what is my best case scenario and what is my worst case scenario to really pencil out and find out what your ROI potential may be. So. Because um, there's think, economics built into all that. Right, yep, you did yep. this, here's the cost. You did that, here's the cost. And the return on that investment, either way, they can and, calculate. And, and just having that plan in place allows you to be nimble later to make changes if you need to do it. Yep. That, that's why it's always important to have a plan, even if it's maybe it's the like worst plan in the world, you've got to have a plan. You know you can erase yeah. later exactly. and You don't around, put it in ink but, for yeah. sure. Yeah. With agriculture, last year is always important. Next year is always feels like the rest of all time. Uh, but we're about to go into 2020, new decade. There's so much science. There's so much data. Uh, technology on the farm is accelerating so fast. As agronomists, what are you paying attention to? What do you think? If if, oh, if wow. I if tomorrow was 2030, what do you think happened in the last 10 years? Boy, 
if I knew that. <laughs> um, well, big data, obviously. Uh, drones, imagery, that is going to continue to improve. Um, especially the satellite imagery side as satellites become more and more powerful. Um, if we can start doing more crop scouting using high resolution imagery, that will help our growers immensely um, just to understand what's going on in the field. Because when I, when I was younger, my, my younger career, I used to walk fields. Nobody truly walks fields anymore. They, they don't have enough time. So using drone imagery, I, I, think, I think it's gonna be the technology side um, is where our customers are really gonna uh, make hay. I, I really do. That's my part anyway. Yeah, and I, I think also using that technology in, uh, in the breeding pipeline, there's a lot of traits that are coming in the future. Um, I think about also crops in general. Man, where's that going in the future? You know, and, and that's a question a lot of people are asking. So um, it's a big open field for a lot of opportunities. That, that's a great point because we all know as agronomists that we need to start doing more diversification of our, of our crops. Yep. Doing this corn soybean rotation year after year or corn on corn on corn over and over and over is not good for the soil. It's, it's ultimately not good for the environment. So we need to get back to the alfalfas, the oats, the, the, the small grains and somehow get markets set up so growers can actually get into that because right now they don't have a lot of areas don't have markets for that. That's yeah. what I was going to say. I don't know if you talked to our regenerative regenerative ag people yet or sustainability yeah. people. Maybe they'll be on tomorrow. Um, but real using, aggressive air quotes around regenerative there. Well, I think there might be some skepticism that we need to. I'm dig all into. for sustainability, but I've often <laughs> said it needs to be. What is sustainable is for farmers to stay in business because if we put a bunch of practices on them that cost them more money. In an in a economic time that they're already very squeezed, that's not sustainable. So we're really fortunate here in FBN, we've got a group, a regenerative agriculture group, who's looking at if a farmer does this more environmentally friendly practice, if they improve the water infiltration rates through their soil, if they improve their organic carbon contents, um, then they could actually sell that crop for a premium through some food processor or to some uh, consumer who's going to desire the fact that this was grown under more sustainable methods. That doesn't really exist quite yet, but I think it's coming probably in two to three years, not ten. Um, and, a, and a company like FBN, fortunately, where we can bring uh, and make those connections happen, the consumer all the way back to the farmer, better than anybody. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Let me throw you guys a real curveball here because I've, I've, I hear a lot about regenerative agriculture and one of the things that I hear is Two, two things that on the science side people are excited about. More perennials, deeper root systems, better for the soil. Yeah. You can talk, unpack that as you will. And more diversity at the same time in the field. So we do, like crop rotations are a great way to diversify mm -hmm. crops over time, but it's kind of shortening that time scale so you have different crops in the field at the same time. All farms are gonna be regenerative in 2030. Hot take. What do you guys think? Uh, all. No. All is a big word. <laughs> I, I would never say all. I would. I would never say I guarantee anything. But there's going to be more. Uh, I we think that's we a good thing. we used to be that way. There used to be so much more alfalfa, which is a deep-rooted crop. Um, cover crops are hoping to get that deep root. And if we could, if we can get two for ones in a season where we do a short season crop and then come back with a second crop, and in many parts of the country we can do that. The upper climates, no, no, we can't do that. But I think that's going to be a big, a big mover of the needle going forward. And that's that's where your your soil structure and your improving your soil in general helps to come in is is that diversification. So all in by 2030. I'm not there, but there there will be the needle heading that There's way. There's a generational change happening in ag, right? And more educated, the younger next generation is more embracing of certain things, taking on a few more risks. But if we can help manage that risk, I think it'll be embraced. Maybe not 100%, but pretty, pretty significantly. If not that, then what is your dark, in, in one word, or maybe like two or three words, what is your dark horse agronomy thing that's like, people don't see it now, but it's gonna be huge. I got this. <laughs> we gotta get way away from just a two crop rotation, right? When you go up and go into other places in the world, 
they're rotating four, five, six crops. You just got to go across the border into Manitoba and they're rotating five, six, seven crops. And when I talk to folks from the I states in the U.S., it's corn and beans, corn and beans, corn, corn, beans, beans. So that's not very diverse. In and my that's mind. where the market is, unfortunately. We got it. We got to get those markets in more regions so farmers can actually get more diversified. It's it's almost, it's a catch twenty two. Yeah. We need to do this, but yeah. we don't have the market on this side to bring it all together. And until that happens, it's yeah. it's a hard change. What do you think? I think so. What's yeah. your dark horse? Agronomy. I think that's a good one. Do you have a different one? No, I think I I think that's a that's a good one. I mean, it's not like nobody's talking about it because, well, okay, another one is nutrient management. Uh, things getting. I, I'm on the Mississippi River watershed, which most of the country is in agriculture. Um, that our, our phosphorus and our nutrients ending up in the river and ending up in the Gulf. We all know that there's problems there. Many of the land grant universities are working on plans right now. Um, many of them were supposed to have their plans done here in the next year or two. Many of them won't have their plan done, but that's going to be another big one. I think in 10 years, we could potentially see restrictions. There's some restrictions already in some states for nutrients. I think there's going to be a lot of states having restrictions on nutrient inputs. Absolutely. That's I mean, gonna, what the consumer wants in 2030, and I'll tell you what uh, the, the producers are going to be geared towards. Smart know. answer. Right answer. Correct answer. <laughs> Thank you guys ding, again. Ding, ding. I win the day, right? <laughs> Thank you guys again so much for joining us. Pleasure. All The Epi and Agronomy team is very impressive, and it's, it's so cool to talk to you guys. I'm going to let you go, get back to farmers, get back to having those discussions. Right. Can't wait to hear what the conclusions you draw. I'm sure all of you are going to have about a thousand new ideas coming away from here about things that farmers are looking for. Sounds but good. Thanks good. again for Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for you guys having are awesome. us.